go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. This is the Country Club Edgewater Village Association SEVA committee member orientation for both the standing committees and the neighborhood committees. Um, we're hoping to provide you with a lot of information and, and hope you leave here with understanding the SEVA organization and how, how your role um, interacts within it. Um, today, I myself, I'm Annie Ross. I'm the Lakewood Ranch Town Hall Interdistrict Authority Executive Director. I'll be starting off the presentation. Then Ms. Christy Valentine is um, the Property Management Coordinator for SEVA. She'll be um, continuing through some of the um, nuts and bolts of the presentation. And then Robin Azar, our Fiscal Manager out of the Finance Department, will be um, bringing in some information about the finance perspectives of the organization. So this is just a brief, the topics that we'll cover. We'll cover a couple of things in the beginning that um, tend to kind of have residents stumbling over just a couple of um, a couple of items that, that tend to cause some, some um, not frustration, but just some misunderstanding. Then we'll go into um, our management from Town Hall the, and the governing documents that are um, kind of give guidance to see the SEVA organization and then on through the committee roles, the, the board members' roles, um, policy and guidances. And then um, at the very end, we'll open do an open forum for your questions, answers, and any, um, any information you want to also share with the with the group. The first item we wanted to kind of do a comparison for is the districts versus HOA. So the community development districts two and five also make up the same jurisdictional boundaries as the Country Club Edgewater Village Association HOA, Homeowners Association. So um, while the districts have a little different purpose than the HOA does. So the districts um, govern the public property, the common areas. They are a special purpose local government managed out of here at Town Hall, and they manage the infrastructure of the community, the roadway, signage, landscaping, um, the entryways your, for each of your, of your neighborhoods, the monuments, um, all of the utilities, whether it be irrigation, stormwater, water and sewer in different cases with, depending on the districts. And the assessments for the district um, services that you receive as a homeowner are actually sent through the property tax bill. Those are um, on an annual basis sent around the, the November time, October, November time frame. Whereas on the HOA side, it's really the HOA's jurisdiction is all the private property. We'd like to say kind of inside your property boundaries for the most part. Um, you know, the architectural landscape modifications you might want to make or the deed restrictions to make sure your neighbors in are, you know, keeping everything looking as aesthetically pleasing like we um, expect when we come into Lakewood Ranch. And there are some areas for the maintenance-free neighborhoods, um, MFNs, those neighborhood pools are actually governed by the HOA through the MFN. Um, we did a, earlier did a presentation for the MFNs because they have some kind of specific um, things that they do, and we'll talk about a little comparison of the traditional neighborhood versus the MFN neighborhood in a moment. And the assessments for the HOAs come to you straight from the banking institution. You get an annual, an annual assessment from SEVA for um, the services that SEVA does for the homeowners is done through a direct mail. So traditional versus maintenance-free neighborhoods, the MFNs have um, the ability to collectively contract for certain items. They're, the developer set up through their supplemental declarations for the neighborhoods certain items that would be taken care of but collectively by the, by the neighborhood. And then they also can expand that through doing some voting for the neighborhood. And those things are like shared landscape services, sharing um, the, taking care of the, um, 
your lights out front, um, some of those items, uh, they can they can also co it also covers if they have a pool and there there's um, approximately nine MFN neighborhoods that have pools. They receive not only the annual assessment that you do as a traditional neighborhood, but they also receive quarterly assessments for all those shared services. And their neighborhood committee actually um, goes through the process of bidding all those services and selecting contractors. So um, in an MFN neighborhood, whereas the the neighborhood committee and um, those residents that are on that committee guide and, and take care of the, the contracts for those shared services. In your traditional neighborhood, you as an individual take care of your lawn landscape, your own um, light out front. Um, so it's just a little bit of a different situation with the MFN neighborhoods. And we just wanted to point out what the differences were. And just for your edification, SEVA, um, the SEVA maintenance-free neighborhoods are shown there. We also have in our Summerfield Riverwalk Village Association, there is one MFN in the forest. So just giving you an idea of where those MFN neighborhoods are if you were curious. So here at Town Hall, we have um, we are employees of the Interdistrict Authority. And we, the Interdistrict Authority Board and the Country Club Edgewater Village Association SEVA Board contract together for management services. So the, the um, two departments that do the main work for the SEVA organization through that management services contract are the Community Association Services and um, they they take care of it's mostly Christy <laughs> and takes care of uh, watching over the deed restrictions and enforcements, the violations and fining, modification requests, other administrative functions, some customer service, and then um, meeting facilitation when when needed. The finance department does your financial services. That's your accounting um, for SEVA, the budget development each year, cash management, um, and estoppels and billings for the properties that change hands. And then also through that agreement, they um, are able to, to utilize the town hall meeting space. The backbone of the SEVA organization is your governing documents. There's three major pieces to it, the declarations of Co Declaration of Covenants, the Articles of Incorporation, and then the bylaws. And each one of those um, kind of tackle a different aspect of the, of the organization. Declaration of Com Covenants establishes your standards, um, maintaining governing and funding, your obligations, and your more of your administrative frame framework. Articles of Incorporation was putting the purpose and power behind the organization, establishing the power of the Board of Directors. And then the bylaws covers um, the governing rules, um, the meeting responsibilities, the voting rights, and the powers and duties of the boards and all the committees. Then your rules and regulations are summarized in your homeowner's manual. Homeowner's manual. That's more of an abbreviation of all the governing documents. So um, if there's anything that's at question, uh, you go back to those governing documents to make sure um, that you're covering what you need as far as a vote or um, how, how you're utilizing the powers that be. So um, we'll talk more about the homeowner's manual and how it's put together when Christy um, talks about it later in the presentation. And with that, I will bring up Christy Valentine. She's going to get into a lot of the nuts and bolts of the organization. Thanks, Annie. Oh, excuse me. Um, this is Christy Valentine, and I am your property management coordinator. And first, um, I want to thank you. I just uh, got a little bit of an oopsie here. Let me. Pull it up, okay. Um, 
We're going to cover a lot of ground right now, and it's a lot of information that's going to be coming at you. And I, I, our goal is not to overwhelm you, but to clear some of the muddy water and better inform you so that when you're asked questions by other residents that you, um, you're prepared with the information. So please don't uh, be overwhelmed by all of this. Uh, what you're looking at is a SEVA organization. And in the SEVA organization, you'll see SEVA uh, was so large and the structure was set this way to develop a link between the SEVA board of directors and the residents. So by breaking off in a couple smaller neighborhood in the neighborhood committees and the standing committees, the residents then have a better and representation with the board and to be heard and in communication. And also with the standing committees and the neighborhood committees. So this is kind of to show you the links uh, between them all. You have your board of directors, which you have five members on your board of directors. And we have here, you have your president, who's your chief executive officer, who is Mike Miller. You have the vice president um, and he exercises any powers and duties uh, for the president when he's needed, and that's Ron Steffen. The treasurer who monitors the financial activities and assists the finance department in the budget development, and that is Chris Gerard. Uh, R. Tabor is your secretary, and he reviews the minutes and he um, executes any association documents as they're needed, and that to be signed. And then there is a director who is Don Divin. Christy, if I could jump in, I'm sorry to mm -hmm. jump in. I, I forgot to introduce that Ms. Gerard, Mr. Tabor, and Mr. Miller are on the line um, for the presentation. Thank you. So the board of directors, um, I'm sorry. Uh, they, they do a lot, they're involved in a lot. Um, a lot goes on behind the scenes that uh, many people don't know, but their main focus is to maintain the integrity of the governing documents. They manage all the affairs and act in the best interest of the association and the community. And they do have a fiduciary responsibility. They set the standards and they manage the expenses. They work uh, directly with the finance department. They conduct and um, open and fair meetings for all residents who are able to um, attend board meetings. They are, board meetings are open to all residents, whether you're on a neighborhood committee or not, or a standing committee. They create an environment, especially for open communication with residents. And they coordinate and communicate with the IDA about issues that come up. And next. All righty. Did I, sorry. No, did you're, I get... you're, 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 pardon me. No, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, so the neighborhood committee and representatives, each neighborhood has seven members that consist of a chairperson, a voting member, an alternate voting member, standing committee representatives. And then some neighborhoods have branched out and they have someone um, who does social and communication. There are a lot of neighborhood get togethers um, and they sometimes uh, residents who live in the neighborhood who are pretty tech savvy will take on communication for the neighborhood. Some neighborhoods have a secretary who assists um, the neighborhood chairperson and takes the minutes from the meetings and turns those in. And in maintenance-free neighborhoods, uh, they may have an irrigation and a pool uh, committee person who uh, maintains communication and takes care of um, that end of the spectrum for maintenance-free neighborhoods. So each fall, as I'm sure you remember, the election process starts and nominations are sent to all individual residents in each neighborhood. Those nominations are put on the ballot and again sent out to each resident. Seven nominees with the highest amount of votes are tallied and this becomes your uh, neighborhood representatives. Then the neighborhood representatives that were voted in 
they meet and they divvy up responsibilities. So it's important to understand too, that the neighborhood committee is not a board. There's only one board and only one board of directors and that's the SEVA board of directors. And it's important to educate your neighborhood of this as many times neighborhoods will uh, consider their neighborhood representatives are their board and this can become very confusing, especially when it comes to rules and regulations. So it's something that is important to uh, lessen that confusion on. And all members um, of the neighborhood committee and standing committees um, must be a neighbor in good standing and they must adhere to the code of conduct. And at the end of this uh, presentation, we will have links where you can uh, get copies of those so you can see those. So once the committee establishes who's going to do what, then that list goes to the SEVA board of directors for approval. Anytime anyone changes a position, whether they're added or they leave, um, I must be notified again so that we can send to the board for approval with any replacements um, that come on board. And a resident uh, can be on the neighborhood committee but not serve on a standing committee. That's important to know. We strongly, strongly suggest that they do to ensure your neighborhood is well rep represented, but it's, uh, but they're, it's not required. So why is it important to have a neighborhood chairperson in a committee? It's uh, because they're your, your conduit between the resident and the board and the board and the residents. The neighborhood chair is responsible for ensuring there's at least one neighborhood meeting a year and that it's noticed correctly to all residents in the neighborhood. All residents are, wel are welcome to attend any neighborhood committee meetings. And neighborhood committees can have as many meetings a year as needed or as they feel necessary, as long as they're noticed correctly. Um, all neighborhood meetings must be posted and noticed to all residents at least a minimum 48 hours in advance. But to be on the safe side, you wanna give everyone several weeks notice so that they can um, make the commitment and work it into their schedules. The meetings can be held wherever you feel it's comfortable and you can accommodate everyone. So there are many uh, of the neighborhood, the maintenance free neighborhoods have them at their pool. Uh, some neighborhoods have them in their homes. You're always welcome to schedule a meeting at town hall and contact the front desk and they'll set that up for you. Or we do have a Zoom account that you can uh, use to have your meetings and that's working extremely well and if you give me a uh, send me an email or contact me I can give you the information for that again everyone um, is willing is um, invited to participate so neighborhood meetings too are a great way to catch up on what's going on with um, everyone in your community to listen to the opinions and suggestions that they have for standing committee representatives to uh, give updates and to take back to the committee's concerns that your neighborhood might have. So usually the neighborhood chair does the minutes. However, uh, like I said, some neighborhoods have a secretary at, that'll do the minutes and then um, you'll be going forward sending me the minutes and I will be recording them on the portal. Neighborhood communication is extremely important and it's one of the most important um, avenues we have to reach out to all residents. So we will be having, um, if you need an updated contact list for the residents in your neighborhood, if you contact me, we will send the list to you. Um, however, our list may not be as current as your list. Many residents, uh, really don't want to keep us informed of their email addresses and phone numbers. We might be pretty far down on the list of people they remember to contact when making those changes, but residents uh, in neighborhoods do want to hear from their neighbors. Uh, sending the minutes to all of the residents in the neighborhood is a great way to let them know what's going on in your neighborhood, but it also reminds them that there are neighborhood meetings and that they can attend. 
And it's okay to have more than one meeting a year if things are coming up in the community and you're attending uh, board meetings and hearing um, things from different committees and that that you feel need to go back to the residents, you're more than welcome to have more than one meeting. We have several uh, neighborhoods that have meetings every month. And again, you can use the town hall facilities for that if you'd like. Uh, there are neighborhoods who send out uh, great newsletters and they and welcome letters to neighborhood uh, new residents as well, letting them know what's going on in their neighborhood and who they should contact. And email blasts uh, out to your the residents in your neighborhood is also too a great way to keep everybody in communication. And again, like some some neighborhoods do have communication representatives, which is um, and and they put that all through them so that they can keep up to date. And we don't wanna forget the ever popular social cocktail gatherings where you can meet new residents and catch up with familiar faces. Um, it, that's a, a great vehicle, but it, communication is, is crucial in your neighborhoods. It's also a great way to recruit new volunteers. And we have had many this year and um, I think that's because we've had so many more uh, residents who have been uh, communicating with other residents in the neighborhood. We also have on the lakewoodranchgov.org website, each neighborhood does have a page on it. And we are working on uh, kind of a template that we will send you and you can put as much information as you would like on it. Um, stating who is your are your neighborhood representatives, um, an MFN can put what they uh, offer in amenities. You can put on there what you offer in amenities. We need to keep in mind on this website that this is a public website. So not only is it seen by residents, but it is also by potential homeowners that are looking uh, to move into Country Club in Edgewater. And this will give them kind of the, the advantage of seeing your neighborhood and what it reflects. So each neighborhood has um, the opportunity to have their neighborhood chair, a neighborhood voting member, and an alternate voting member. So the neighborhood chair is one responsibility, a voting member is another responsibility, and the alternate voting member is another responsibility. So there are three positions here. Most neighborhoods, their neighborhood chair is also their voting member, but it doesn't have to be. Again, you can have three different people doing each job. And it's important to have a voting member to ensure your neighborhood is well represented when votes come up. If a resident is on the board of directors, they can be the neighborhood chair, but they cannot be a voting member or an alternate voting number member. So that's important to know as well. So when is a vote required? Neighborhood votes um, come up quite a bit and it's generally they happen when a neighborhood wants to change an existing neighborhood standard. Um, something like the uh, allowing basketball hoops or allowing fences, uh, minimum lease requirements or yard uh, lamp head replacements. So when that comes up in a neighborhood, these are this is something that a neighborhood wants to consider. The vote will go out to the entire neighborhood and we at CAS conduct and manage the votes um, to ensure that um, we're getting everything we possibly can from every address we possibly can. And we generally allow 30 days uh, for people to send in their ballots. A simple 51% of the neighborhood must vote to deem a quorum and not less than 60% of those who voted uh, must have voted in favor for the vote to pass. Also to note, when you get your neighborhood uh, 
committee voting package in the fall, there's um, always a voting certificate in there and only one member of a household uh, can vote for whatever the vote is. Whoever is voting must be on the deed of the house, um, but it's only one person. And that's why that's in, you get that and, and can send it back. And there's also time for membership votes. And membership votes um, occur when there's a change in the governing documents. And most of it is uh, would be something that could be in the neighborhood supplements that leans more towards the maintenance-free neighborhoods. But if there was to be a change, say, in the leasing structure um, of what is in the declaration, of covenants that would require a membership vote. So that would go out to all uh, properties in SEVA. So standing committees. What a standing committee does is they gather information, opinions, and concerns uh, from a panel comprised of volunteers from each neighborhood um, the modification and finding committee are a little bit different and we'll discuss that later. And they relay this information to the board of directors at the monthly uh, business meeting. And they also um, give any feedback or any new information from the board of directors back to uh, the committee. There is a board liaison who attends the standing committee meetings to ensure that the government uh, governing documents are upheld and they do not make decisions or votes in those meetings. They're just there for guidance. Um, all standing committee meetings are open to all residents. And standing committees, it's important to know too, do not make policy. They only make recommendations to the board. Only the SEVA board can make policy. Well, the modification is a standing committee. And if you can think back and remember on the form that was filled out with, um, with the different um, standing committees, you could be on the modification committee is not on there. And that's because it's uh, a little bit different than the other standing committees. There are two separate um, modification committees. One is for Country Club and one is for Edgewater. And on each of these committees, um, I have on there who the chairperson is and who the board liaison is so that if you, um, you'll get a copy of this and you can always go back and you can, um, so that you can have that information. So these individuals on the modification committee are board appointed. And there's a criteria on how uh, you can be on the panel and how many members can be on the panel. Uh, to, they have to have a quorum in order to have a meeting. And um, so it's, it's a big um, a commitment for someone to make. So to be a panel member on the modification committee, first there has to be an opening. And then the person would need to attend at least three or four meetings as a guest. They're not permitted to comment or to vote. They're there um, to, as a spectator and to, um, and to learn. And then they see how much, um, if this is going to be a fit for them, if they're going to be able to make the commitment and if it's a good match too with the modification committee. Once it's been decided, um, the modification committee then will recommend the person to the SEBA board of uh, directors for approval. So the modification committee um, meets twice a month. The meetings can be two hours long. The meetings are on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. And all modifications and documentations have to be received no later than noon on the Thursday prior to the meeting. And the reason we do that is there may be some uh, modifications that require the modification panel to go look at the property so that they can see exactly what it is the resident wants to do. Um, they are volunteers, so we like to give them enough time that they can work it into their schedule. There can also be joint member uh, joint meetings. 
with other committees uh, from time to time too. So again, it, it is a big commitment. Um, they do a phenomenal job. So the, the point, what the um, modification committee does is they review the requests and they approve or deny the request based on all of the governing documents. The finding committee is a little bit different too, although it does, um, the panel consists of one member from each neighborhood and their sole purpose of the finding committee is to review violations that have not been brought into compliance, listen to the historical details of the violation and confirm or deny the fine amounts previously approved by the board of directors if a violation occurred within the SEVA governance. This meeting does require a quorum um, to conduct the meeting and panel, panel members must abstain from voting on violations in their neighborhood. So the panel uh, can vary from meeting to meeting uh, depending on uh, what neighborhoods violations may have occurred in. So the committee meets once a month and we try uh, very hard to keep the dates consistent for our volunteers. So it may be uh, one year we may try to keep it as to the, like the third Thursday of each month, but it can vary due to legal stipulations with the governance and the Florida statute. So it's not always ex the same as some other committees when you know exactly what date it's going to be on. The landscape committee, again, there's one member per neighborhood and the meeting is highly attended and, and it's great information uh, for you and your, and your neighborhood. And they work closely with the CDD2 and CDD5 and they discuss and make recommendations in regards to landscaping and landscape maintenance. And they re research many topics to ensure the community is updated on the latest issues or changing trends to maintain the integrity of the community. They bring this information then back um, to the modification committee at times and to the restriction uh, revision committee uh, for opinions and su suggestions. They work very closely. The chairperson does attend the monthly um, board of directors meeting and they give an update of what's go going on. So the committee generally meets um, every other month and with a few months off in the summer. Uh, restrictions revision is again, one neighborhood per, uh, one member per neighborhood. And every year they take a look at the rules and restrictions to make sure they're still relevant and everything is within the SEVA governance. And I'm sure as you're aware, they took on the monumental task of completely reviewing and looking at the homeowner's manual. Um, it took well over a, a year, but they, um, they reviewed every word and tied it back to the governing documents. Um, they, it was a, a monumental commitment and they did a fantastic job. And, and I think it's, we've had a lot of compliments on how much easier it is for the um, residents to field their way through and uh, just a fantastic job. They also to work very close with all of the committees. So they get opinions and suggestions and they also do the same with residents. If a resident um, feels that uh, restriction is too restrictive or they aren't restrictive enough, they can go to the restrictions revision uh, committee and they will listen and they will see what guidelines it's in. And they also, um, they report all of this at the monthly uh, board of directors meetings who uh, will review it. And the restrictions revision um, committee does not make the policies. They only make recommendations to the board and the board makes um, the policies. So they meet on the first Thursday of the month and they do take also a couple months off during the summer.
and the safety committee. Uh, one member from each neighborhood. The committee meets and discusses safety issues within the community and the surrounding areas. They work closely with the sheriff's department to stay up to date with any issues they should know about. And they pass this information on to the neighborhoods and the board of directors. Uh, they make updates to the board of directors at the monthly business meeting and uh, to the board as to what's going on. Their meetings are, are highly attended and very informative. Um, and that's great information for the safety uh, committee um, person in your neighborhood to keep residents informed of, of what's going on. So, uh, you know, with that note, um, I want to clarify too that each member of the community is responsible for their own safety and SEVA does not assume any liability on behalf of members of the community. community. The safety committee is an informational um, committee that uh, can make recommendations. So we've gone through all the standing committees, the neighborhood committees, and I know that this can seem all consuming uh, because we've covered a lot of material and you're probably wondering what you got yourself into, but uh, please remember you'll only be doing a portion of this and that you'll be part of a team in your neighborhood and that the value of what you do as a volunteer and serving your community is what keeps this community one of the top master plan communities that people from all over the world come uh, to, and to move here. So now I'll turn it, the meeting over to Robin Azar from the finance department. Thanks, Christy. Uh, so this is Robin Azar. I'm the fiscal manager here at Town Hall. I oversee the fiscal functions of the HOAs and maintenance-free neighborhoods, including uh, facilitating the monthly finance committee meetings. Uh, our chair is K Gail Cole, and our board liaison is Chris Gerard, uh, treasurer of the SEVA Board of Director Directors. And uh, just as the other committees, finance committee is made up of uh, one member, uh, the finance representative of the individual neighborhoods. And while members uh, from traditional neighborhoods are more than welcome to attend our monthly meetings, the topics and work involved mainly pertain to the maintenance-free neighborhoods. Uh, we cover various topics such as, you know, reserve replacement schedules, or we could be reviewing current policies and making subsequent recommendations to the board. So next, I'm just going to give a brief overview of our um, budget development process. Uh, and I'll start by uh, noting the differences between the HOAs and the uh, district and IDA budget uh, schedules. The HOAs operate on a calendar year structure, January to December, while the IDA and the uh, community development districts operate on a fiscal year. And that runs from every October to the end of September. Because of that timing difference, uh, SEVA begins to work alongside the IDA very early every calendar year as the IDA starts to develop its budget to determine the management fees that will be set for the following calendar year. Uh, we then kick off the budget development process for the maintenance-free neighborhoods at the June Finance Committee meeting. We give committee members the month of July to complete their budgets for their neighborhoods, and then those are reviewed by the Finance Department. And then the committee comes back in August and reviews the completed, uh, completed budgets and then provides recommendation to the board of directors for approval at their uh, September board meeting. From those finalized budgets, we then send out the annual and quarterly assessment notices that you receive every year shortly after uh, Thanksgiving. So that's really the, the, the short version of our, of our finance committee for traditional neighborhoods. And as Christy said, we're that throwing a lot of information for at, at you. And so if you didn't write it all down or you didn't get it from this presentation, we do have a couple of websites where you can find additional information. Uh, our first website is our public website, and you'll find information here pertaining to both the uh, HOAs and the districts. It's a high level uh, community information and there's links to things such as our community calendar, which uh, is going to show events occurring uh, at Town Hall and any of our parks. 
uh, you can access our online reservation system uh, or find any general details about the community, such as who the current board members are, committee members, or high-level description of services that are provided within a particular neighborhood. The second website is our private homeowners portal, and only current residents of Siva, Serva, or Greenbrook have access to the site, and a login with an account number and password is required. Homeowners can view uh, account-specific details here, such as transactions or violation details. They can make payments or complete various other functions through the use of web forms, such as respond to a violation or submit a modification request. Neighborhood and standing committee members also have additional permissions here that grant them access to committee-specific information, which could include policies or guiding documents, agendas and minutes to your meetings, financial statements to your for your neighborhoods, or links to the current agreements for shared services within the neighborhood. Um, you, if you have any trouble accessing any of the information within the homeowners portal, please email me directly and I'll work with you to make sure that we get you what, what you're looking for. So if you're not able to find the information that you're looking for, this is kind of a, a, a who do I contact? Anything financial related, financial statements, budgets, contracts, homeowner portal related, you can contact me. Um, we also have some additional finance staff that service the HOAs. Brittany Schmel processes our um, HOA payments and uh, handles our homeowner account inquiries. And then Debbie Baugh handles, uh, processes all of our vendor payments. Um, anything deed restriction, violation, leases, modifications, or board meeting related, you would contact your property management coordinator, Christy Valentine. Uh, if you're having, if you're seeing any issues regarding the common areas, uh, then you would contact our operations office. And then any other items, you can either contact Town Hall or, when in doubt, contact Christy. Our last slide shows some um, policies and procedures and guiding documents that we are going to be including when we distribute this uh, presentation to the committee members. Um, so, the first four are specific to um, serving on a committee, code of conduct, being a resident, good standing, standing committee policy, and the last two are kind of finance related. We have the HOA and MFN general fiscal policies and procedures, and this gives uh, an overview of it, kind of like a start to finish in the finance process. You know, we go, it runs through the budget development process and also um, guidelines on um, vendor payments and approval processes. And then uh, I'll also provide a quick overview of the budget development process, pretty much kind of what I went through here, just kind of a timeline from, from start to uh, finalization. So I think the next portion of our uh, program is the, the open forum or information share. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Annie. Thank you, Robin. Um, this uh, this period is we. If you have any questions, um, feel free to raise your hand or send us a chat. We've had a few things through the chat, but n no questions to share at this point. We did have somebody have to leave a little early for another commitment, and um, we are recording the orientation. We'll make it available through the portal, or um, probably send a link also to all of the committee members. But right now, I just welcome any questions. Um, Mr. Miller had had uh, volunteered to start us off because he wanted to just cover a few things about um, about SIVA and um, some questions he had. Okay. Uh, thank you, Annie. <laughs> the uh, uh, I'd like to expand a little bit on on the subject of communications. Uh, Christy talked a bit about the things that we do to try to communicate well and, and, and communicate actively out to our committees as well as homeowners. And the, uh, you know, we, I think we all generally try to think that no news is good news, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's very common in our board meetings that, that we are talking all the time about, you know, are we, are we doing enough? Are, are we in touch with the homeowners? Are we in touch with our committees? 
and you always kind of worry about, um, you know, whether whether we are and are we uh, adequately representing uh, the issues and the in the considerations that all of our constituents have. Um, this is a pretty big community. There's about 2,800 of us uh, here in SEBA. So uh, the uh, this week, this month's meetings, we're going to be talking again about potentially doing some form of a homeowner survey. Uh, for those of you that have been around a while or, or, or are new, uh, you might know that, you know, we've been here as an organization for about 20 years, maybe just over that. And yet in that period of time, there's actually never been uh, a homeowner survey to, to, uh, to, to try to take an overall temperature of the, you know, SEBA resident population. So we're thinking a lot about it. Um, probably the biggest hurdle that we're very worried about is, of course, very few people respond, right? You do surveys and you know, typical response rate is really low. So if we, if we try to do one, uh, you know, will, we, will, we, will that really uh, achieve the outreach that we're looking for? So in that context, I'd like to kind of uh, put everyone, you know, make, put it out to everybody on this call. Uh, as members of our neighborhood committees, as leaders of our neighborhood committees, I'd ask you to help us think about it uh, and think about how the neighborhood committees might help us. Right there, we could we could potentially approach uh, trying to do some more outreach at several levels. We could think about doing some form of of um, homeowner survey. We could think about re, you know doing some outreach through the neighborhood committees to, as an as another or as a supplemental vehicle to try to be sure that we're listening to our homeowners. So. Uh, as I said, it's, 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 an, it's been an active discussion. We're going to be talking about it more in this month's SEVA board meetings. Uh, and, I, and I invite all of you to help us think it through um, and, and kind of be alert that um, I, I think it's pretty likely we will be doing more outreach. Um, the, the neighborhood committees are a great vehicle to try to help us in doing some outreach, just to be sure that um, we're asking what's on everyone's minds. We're asking how people feel about the services that they, they get from the HOA, how they feel about um, everything from the new homeowner's manual to the modifications process to you know, the state of our restrictions, uh, you know, all, all the topical uh, items. So uh, that's, that's really what I wanted to just kind of add to the point of communication. We're definitely trying to think about how do we do the best outreach and, and invite you to participate. Annie? Thank you, Mike. Um, I actually don't have anybody that has raised their hands or um, put everything into the, the chat. So if anybody does have a question, if we weren't, oh, Mr. Keene, let me, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I was just wondering if uh, there will be hard copies of this presentation available uh, to, to share uh, with our neighbors. Yes, we'll both make uh, hard copies of the presentation in a PDF format that you'd be able to email out. And then also we'll have a link where if they would want it at the le leisure, watch the video. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Goldshaw. Yes, hi. Uh, I thought I read that um, there won't be any more physical meetings at Town Hall. Did I get that right? It's going to be all done via Zoom? Um, actually, we've, we've, SEVA itself has been having um, in-person meetings. We've been doing a hybrid for quite a while. The most of the board members come to here to town hall. Um, we are limited in how many audience seats we have, but I don't believe we've um, hit that limit to date. So um, many people do like to participate via Zoom, and so that's worked well, but um, the board members are actually here for the meetings. Okay, so yeah, I, and I wanted to make sure I had it right because I've gone to the meetings physically at town hall, and I've been also Zooming, uh, but um, 
I thought I, I, I read this note and I thought they were trying to say, we're not going to allow you know, people to be there physically, but that's not the case. So I'm glad so I can attend. I, I've noticed there's always plenty of room when you, when you go to town hall and space down and you get so much more from those meetings. And I would also mention that uh, for the purposes of uh, general information, when you are having those even board meetings, uh, while I've been zooming on them, um, very often people forget to speak into the mic and you really lose a lot of the feel for the meeting, which is why I go to the meeting. <laughs> You know, you really, people aren't speaking up. Uh, you can't hear a lot of the, the sidebar conversations you can't hear at all. So you uh -huh. miss the feel of what's really happening. So um, whatever people can do to, to go into the mic would be very helpful for overall communication. But good, I, I will be attending physically. Um, and what about for the traditional neighborhoods like the one I'm in, uh, CDD2 is the same thing. I can be, be continue to attend physically. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see anybody else. Is there um, anybody else that might have a question? Well, with that then, um, please feel free to contact staff um, however needed. If you think of something after the presentation, you'll be, of course, getting emails from, from Christy with updates and from Robin. So um, we're here to help you. And if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank you very much for spending this time with us. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you both Robin and Christy and then the board members as well, Mr. Tabor, Ms. Gerard, and Mr. Miller. Thank you um, for Annie, coming Annie, in. Annie, Annie yes, can I interrupt? Yes. Um, Mr. Flinton has his hand raised. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Mm -hmm. All right, you should be able to unmute yourself. Number one, am I supposed that I'm kind of new to Zoom, but am I supposed to be seeing a picture of the people or whatever? Or Not a We've been um, presenting the picture of the presentation itself. Right now, I'm showing the who do I contact field or screen. Uh, yeah, that, that's, on, yeah that, that's on my screen. Anyway, so I, I, I didn't even know whether we don't take a roll call or anything, so I didn't even know whether, even though I signed in, that I was actually present for the meeting. Yes, this one is just a training, and we we're, we're appreciate very much that you've come and, and listened in and, and just kind of hopefully you've learned some new things today. I've learned a lot, but I'm still concerned with the Zoom meetings I've done for business. We always take a roll call or whatever, and, and we didn't have a roll call, and you said there were 17 members, uh, and I was just curious to, if you can post that, that who's present. We can work on that if you'd like to see who, who participated. We, we typically do roll call during the um, board meetings, and so that um, definitely is done during that. With this, it was just a training session, so it was um, you know, more of a, a well, I not required. I definitely needed, yeah, I definitely needed the training session, but I wasn't sure whether I was being trained <laughs> or whether I was uh, noticed that I was here. Anyway, thank oh, you. Oh. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, any, if anybody else doesn't have anything, once again, feel free to reach out to us and thank you for being a part of the presentation. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>